What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast, the official podcast of MetalNexus.net. I am one of your hosts, Daniel Terry, and with me, as always, is Jonathan Beatty. How are you doing, man? Doing good. It was uh, a lot of fun hearing someone else talk for an hour because uh, I didn't have any prep to do for this interview. <laughs> oh, and we talked a lot longer than that, too. Uh, in case you didn't know, our guest this week was Jason Sherlock from the band Revulsed. Or if you're tuning in because you know the name Jason Sherlock, you already know that he played drums in Mortification for a while. He played drums in Paramecium, which then became Exor- in Exordium, which, uh, well, didn't technically become Revulsed, but yeah, it basically became Revulsed. So this dude is prolific, and he's been on like a bunch of other bands, too. He played in Deliverance for an album, which was really cool, and uh, he recorded the Horde album back in the back in the 90s under an anonymous name, but now that it's 2019, we all feel, you know, it's, it's okay to talk about it. So <laughs> uh, talk about it, we did. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of niche stuff. I hope uh, I hope our regular listeners aren't thrown off too much by this one, uh, but the band that Jason plays in Revulsed is an incredible technical death metal band, which is like so up my alley. It's not even like it's not even fair. And uh, I've I've been listening to this guy play drums since I was a kid, and I, I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, I think he's right up there with the Gene Hoaglands of the world. It's funny. I think. Uh... Listening to this conversation, it definitely felt like... Actually, I'll say more to the fact of the interviews you've gotten to do by yourself. There just is this level of fandom that I don't even know if it comes across in my interviews at all. <laughs> You're like, so you put out a new album, right? Probably <laughs> shit. No, no, it wasn't like that. I, I mean, it was like that. I mean, I definitely do fanboy out, and I appreciate that I'm allowed to do that in a professional capacity. Yeah. And uh, But no, it was definitely fun. Jason is a cool guy, man. He He knows so many bands, and... He's just so ingrained in the scene, and it's crazy, too, because, like, for having the beginnings uh, that he had, you know, playing in predominantly, like, faith-based or Christian-type bands, it's really cool getting to know the man behind that, because I think a lot of people just assume that you're a certain kind of person, you know, when you make music like that, and, you know, listening to him in the interview, it's, like, more of a, hey, I've got these beliefs, and, you know, my music has those beliefs in him, but he's not, like, an exclusionary, you know, I don't make music specifically for people that believe the same things I do, and uh, it was, I've never interviewed a Christian artist that's like, yeah, and then all these non-Christian artists also have really positive mes- messages, too. Check this out, and check this out, and check this out, and uh, I found that I found that really, really refreshing. What uh, you know, the thing that was kind of interesting to me about it is, I guess you know, based on some of the band names that he's in, I guess that's the funny thing is you look at the band name and you're probably like, oh, like Satan bands and or Satan worshiping bands and songs about you know fucking fucking corpses and mutilation and all this kind of stuff, and it, it, that's not the case. Well, there's definitely some mutilation in there, but uh, but yeah. Well, probably of your your mortal mortal flesh because you know you're trying to repent. Well, yeah, absolutely. So there there's a little bit of that there, and um, no, like what I like about Revulse too is it's kind of the first band that he's been in that's not blatantly that, you know, that's not um, it's not blatantly like a a, a religious beat you over the head sort of thing. Um, it's a, it's a death metal band like first and foremost, and uh, I think that's a really important step, and I think that you know they they prove that they've got the chops just by being a great band and uh there's there's no hand holding they they did everything with this band you know in in the death metal scene not the christian scene or the you know because realistically i don't i don't necessarily know if there's a lot of people that would listen to this band and say oh it it's got you know faith based lyrics or whatever it it's more of just a Hey, here's a death metal band, but they don't have a negative, like a negative, a negative take. Yeah, and like it's so fucking brutal. I can't like I can't quantify that. Like they're just it, it's it, this guy's always been extreme. I think the first band he was in was extreme, and now this is like that, but like the modern version of that, and it's it's far more technical. It sounds amazing, and like I'm not on their payroll. Like I'm not just saying this because. Any, anybody that knows me that if I thought that if I thought it was terrible, I would tell you. I think I think anybody that knows me or listens to my podcasts, y- you know that I'm not just blowing smoke. You know, <laughs> like this is uh, this is this is really cool stuff, and uh, I, I just uh, I, I I really love being able to talk to him because it was a uh, it was a bucket list interview for sure. Um, you know, I don't get a, I don't get the opportunity to talk to somebody that I've been listening to for decades very often. 
it's getting more frequent, but definitely a conversation I was looking forward to having. And I would love to, I mean, him and I probably talked for an equal amount of time after we were done doing the interview. <laughs> yeah, he made the comment that the interview was he seemed surprised it was already over. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, the, the problem the problem with an hour and a half interview is I don't I don't want to lose you guys either. You know, I want you to I want you to put the interview down and uh, start listening to the band immediately. You know, like that's that that that's what we're going for with that. So, but you know, it doesn't mean we can't have them on for a part two. You know, so there there there's <laughs> plenty to unpack there. There's so many other bands. I was gonna say there's there's enough. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh yeah I'm glad uh I'm glad that at least that that you enjoyed it and uh I guess uh, I guess it's good a time any I mean we keep talking about it we might as well just get into it. So let's get into my interview with Jason Sherlock of Revulsed and we will talk to you guys afterwards. <laughs> So I have the pleasure this evening, evening for me, early afternoon for him, or late morning for him, with uh, Jason Sherlock of Revulsed. How are you doing this morning? Oh, I'm doing pretty well, thanks, man. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, anytime. I've been wanting to do this interview for a while, and uh, I'm glad that I was able to kind of get to it. Um, you guys have That's had great. a lot of you guys have had a lot of really uh, interesting stuff happen uh, just in the past. It looks like, I mean really just the past six months to a year with revulsed you guys signed to a new record label yep and you reissued your previous album now i know that infernal atrocity came out in 2015 yep and it was essentially impossible to find uh at least you know for somebody like me you could stream it i think somebody had it on youtube for a while you could buy i think you could listen to it on Bandcamp. but uh yeah, yeah, as yeah. far as getting a, a physical copy goes uh, so I was just wondering what that was, what the uh, what the deal was with that, like how uh, why it was so hard to find. Well, yeah, look, I, I think um, <laughs> without throwing anyone under the bus, really, um, I don't know how. Look, I, look, I'm sure that I'm sure that our our previous label honoured honoured orders uh, that came in, but it was pretty much only available from permeated records like for the probably the first maybe i don't know i guess maybe six months of its release i guess and then um we put it up on our band camp page event well actually no it probably even took longer than that might have even taken a year a year and a half before we actually put it up on our band camp page uh in physical form um it took us a long time to get our band band camp page together with all the merch and stuff and and releases and and things. So, um, you know, apologies for that for it being so difficult to sort of get hold of. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've got no complaints now. I mean, I've got my vinyl copy coming in the mail as we speak. So, oh, that's good. Yeah, look, I mean, yeah, I, again, without sort of divulging too much, you know, we're we're you know, look. First and foremost, we're incredibly grateful for, for what, you know, Permeated have done for us, obviously, from the outset, um, setting us up and, and, you know, basically, you know, establishing us um, in, in the underground scene. But, you know, um, uh, Everlasting Spew has definitely, you know, taken taken us to the next level and, and given us more opportunities, that, you know, that we're going to be looking forward to uh exploring into the future you know and it's obviously begun with the um reissue of infernal on vinyl of course now was there a vinyl release before or was it only available on cd before it was only available on cd before look the whole reason why we actually did the full gatefold cover by pa olivson from sweden is was to you know um take advantage of you know um a vinyl uh, gatefold cover um, format, but just for some reason or another, it just never it never eventuated with the previous label. So it took us a, a long time. Well, it took us what four years to basically get um, the, the permeated guys to agree to let us 
you know, sort of retain the rights to the cover and, and look for another label and, and get it get it released on vinyl, you know. Um, yeah, finally. So it, it, it took us a long time to sort of get to that stage. Um, yeah, yeah, the main guy from Permeated is very, very, he's a really busy dude. He's got a lot of a lot of businesses and he's got a lot on his plate. And um, yeah, so he's got a family and stuff. So he's been pretty distracted from the label. Um, so that's kind of understandable that it's taken so long, but, um, yeah, we just, we, yeah, we just want to apologize that it's taken so long and finally, you know, we're able to, to, to get it released in that format, which is kind of what we wanted from the beginning, really. Right. Well, I don't think an apology is necessary. I mean, we, everybody's got, we've got it all now that that's one of the, the fun things about preparing for this interview today is I was able to just pull up my streaming app and, uh, and listen to everything. And, uh, you know, I got to listen to Infernal. So one of the cool things I thought about uh, how you guys released Infernal Atrocity and then you guys released a live version. It's a live version of basically the album played all the way through. Um, what, what was that like setting that up? It was good. It was, it was you know, relatively. Look, man, I mean, you know, there are so many crazy stories, you know, really um, of, you know, provision, I believe, from God anyway. Just and you know, you know the biggest one. I mean, look, obviously, when we recorded Infernal, you know, it was just myself and Sheldon. Um, I'm playing drums and Sheldon's doing guitar. So you know, we never really obviously had the opportunity to play live anywhere. You know, so uh, but we always wanted to do that. We always wanted to, you know, be be a live band, even though it's in a you know we're not playing a lot of shows and we're certainly not doing any tours or anything because we're all family family guys. But um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so basically, yeah, with, with Connie, uh, from, from Germany, from, from defeated sanity and dis- despondency, he was never going to be able to play live with us, you know, unless we actually went over to Europe or, or somewhere and actually played, you know, relatively close to him, you know, so, you know, we always wanted to find local guys, um, to form, a, you know, a live band, you know, so, you know, one day, I need, you know, I was just, you know, trying, I was trying really hard for a couple of years to find a vocalist, you know, looking in all different you know, avenues and, you know, different uh, classified ads and all this kind of stuff, just trying my hardest to try and find a vocalist, just basically in my own strength, you know, just trying to do everything myself, you know, and at the end of the day, I just got sick of it, you know, I just like, God, just do whatever you want to do, I'm totally over this, this is, I'm done, this is just, this is, you know, screwing, doing my head in. And then the very next day, you know, I kind of just wanted to clear my head. So I went to get a haircut and um, the girl who was cutting my hair, her husband was a death metal vocalist who lived five minutes up the road from me. Of course. He wasn't in a band. He was looking for a band and he'd found Revolst a week before on band camp. And, and the rest is, uh, tell me, you know, that th- there is no such thing uh, you know there are coincidences, and there are and there are things that are not coincident. That that's just insane. I mean, who does that? Yeah, I mean that can't. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's incredible. Just the idea of that. You know, you're, you're looking and you're think of how many think of how many nights you know you're going to sleep and you're worrying. Man, I really really need to find a vocalist, and this guy lives literally five minutes down the road from you. You know, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and and not only that, I mean, you know. I don't know. I, I guess, in, from my experience, vocalists can be, yeah, you know, some vocalists can be divas, you know. And um, I've been blessed, you know, with guys who've just been absolutely down to earth, amazing, amazing people. Connie and now Damien, you know, and, and Damien is one of my best mates. He's so so cruisy, so easygoing, so down to earth, no ego, nothing. Just same as Connie, and. I just I just love working I love working with him I love hanging out with him he's just awesome I just I couldn't and he and he's absolutely as brutal as hell you know he's just absolutely brutal I'm just so proud to have him on board yeah it was cool getting to uh, getting to hear you guys play some cover songs too of some songs that I mean uh, that that I've loved for years you know Cannibal Corpse Gore Guts Death Testament I mean you, uh, for that for your covers collection that was. Uh, that was unexpected. I know when I started seeing the uh, updates on Facebook, I was like, "Oh no way!" So, what, what, what was that like for you guys, as far as um, as far as far as putting that together, or was it just kind of the uh, the push to have some kind of release with the current lineup? 
A little bit. There's a little bit of that uh, came into play, but I'll tell you that there's another story behind that. Basically, what we wanted to do is we wanted to just uh, do a test and just to see whether we could record, do a full recording at Sheldon's house, so we didn't have to go anywhere. We, you know, we could record the drums there. We could, you know, the guitars, vocals, everything, uh, rather than, you know, taking because, you know, you obviously it's really easy to record guitar, uh, guitars and bass um, at home, but usually drums and maybe vocals, you know, it might be a little bit trickier to sort of do that. You might have to go to a studio and, you know, actually record it properly, but. You know, Sheldon invested in a bunch of gear and you know, a bunch of mics and mics and just all the gear that, you know, outboard gear and, um, you know, interface and all the rest of it. So we could actually, you know, have that set up at his place. And um, that, was, that was basically the reason why we, we thought, okay, what's going to be, you know, we don't particularly have any new songs, you know, ready. This was back when we recorded the covers in the middle of last year. Um, let's, let's do some, let's do something really quick and easy. Let's do some covers and use it as a test if it turns out well and we're really really happy with it then that that's been a success and then you know moving forward we know that we can record future albums and future recordings at sheldon's house and we don't need to sort of you know go anywhere else so or if it was a failure then at least we know you know we had a bit of fun we did a bit of testing and you know okay well that didn't work, so you know we're have, going to have to go somewhere else to record drums and vocals. But as it turned out, it turned out really, really well. We were really surprised at how well it turned out. So we thought, well, we've recorded these covers. Let's 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 release them, you know. But just release them, just release them as free, free versions to avoid any any you know uh, you know legal sort of entanglements or anything like sure, that. Sure, so, yeah, because somebody yeah. somebody will come at you if you start selling it on disc or something like that. Absolutely, or, or even just selling, you know, digital, uh, you know, downloads as well. So we just wanted to make sure that they were, all of them were available for free. You know, very cool. Yeah, it sounds like you guys have had a, had a really exciting year, um, and I know there's a new album coming on the uh, horizon. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's coming in 2020. 2020. All right, set your calendar for early 2020. Uh, <laughs> probably, possibly not. Possibly not. It's probably, it could be probably a little, little bit later towards uh, towards the later half of the year. So I mean, you know, most of the material is is written. Yeah, you know, probably ninety five percent of it is written. Um, but we've got to start, you know, doing demos proper and and, and all the rest of it. We did um, record a little bit of one of the new songs during the uh, covers collection sessions. So, you know, we might, we might sort of end up doing something with that, but we'll just sort of have to see. Well, there is a, uh, there's a, a topic that we, we tend to bring up on this podcast, especially in all of our interviews, just trying to get as many perspectives as we can on it. But in the current state of, of music, as far as how people consume music, how people buy music, uh, or if people, I don't know if people still buy music or not. Uh, <laughs> I do, but I, I don't know yeah. how many people I, at large do. do. But yeah, uh, no, I do you think that uh, you know in this day and age that it's still profitable for bands to put out full length albums, or is it almost smarter? I, I've noticed a lot of there's been a lot of groups that have just been releasing similar to how you did with the with the covers, uh, you know, just kind of releasing singles uh, at regular intervals to keep people interested. Yeah, well, I think there's, you know, there's definitely, there's definitely, you know, viability for that sort of option too. Um, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm an old school kind of guy, and, you know, I'm pushing 50, you know, so I, I like the idea of, you know, re- recording a, a group of songs. You know, I, I like the idea of, you know, recording a, a, a full length album, you know, I mean, I, even even recording EPs, I'm not even sort of, you know, too massively big on recording EPs. I love full length albums and, and stuff. I mean, as I said, you know, with the covers collection, that was a that was a you know a, a definitely a, um, a different thing for us to do and a different thing for me to do. You know, I've, I've never it's just the one and only time I've ever actually really recorded covers, apart from you know bits and pieces on on other albums that I've been on uh, and stuff like the Deliverance thing. But um, yeah, yeah, well, I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I like I like albums, and um, you know, I'm, I'm 
you know, blown away that we're able to get to release vinyl. N- not a lot of labels, underground labels anyway, have the facility to, you know, release vinyl. So, you know, we're pretty blessed that um, Everlasting Spew are able to do that for us. Yeah, they had a really cool... Um... They had a really cool splatter vinyl that I think I missed the bus on. Actually, it might might have still been available. I can't remember why I went with the black. I tend to like black vinyl more, just be, even though I I know a lot of my buddies that are big audio nerds all say that a black vinyl sounds better than a regular vinyl. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I I mean, I like the look of black vinyl too. It's just it's just a more of a traditional kind of you know true kind of vinyl look, but. You know, obviously, you know, when there's an opportunity to do a limited run of a more, you know, special sort of wacky kind of thing, then, you know, why not, you know? And I think there's only one there's only one left in the world, so who wants to get a jump on the band campaign? <laughs> right. Now, to to avoid going into my into my fanboy moment, um, I've been listening to you play <laughs> drums since I was, you know, um, relatively small. Let's you, put it this way. They uh, hide the grass off of me. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> sorry. But since Adam was a boy. Right. Uh, basically since, since I was, uh, you know, only allowed to listen to Christian music, you know, I think, uh, a, a lot of guys, a lot of guys like me, especially from Missouri, you know, we, we all kind of start off, uh, <laughs> only listening to stuff like that. So the first time I heard you was obviously, uh, was obviously in mortification, um, not all the way back in 1990. Actually, the first time I probably heard mortification was like, 2002 i'd heard an album that came out it wasn't really my thing but then as i started to go backwards uh i started finding <laughs> finding finding different things to like uh on, on some of the older albums and uh do you uh do you still get uh do you still get a lot of your a lot of your correspondence with people like people contacting you and stuff in reference to mortification or has it all kind of moved on to uh to revulsed yeah thank goodness <laughs> Thank, thank God it's all moved on now. Yeah, I think before, I mean, yeah, definitely before Revolt started and even before, you know, Exordium sort of started, which was the reformation of Power uh back in 06. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of, a lot of you know, people would just, oh, when are you going to record Scrolls 2? When are you going to re- record Scrolls Part 2, you know? And um, I always wanted, what's that? I see you said you're like, I did. Uh, it's called Inexordium. Well, that, well, that's it. That, that that's exactly right, man. You, you know, like I, yeah, you, you've nailed it. You know, and I and I hope you know that I've sort of exceeded it um, on Infernal and you know for the new one, you know, even another step beyond. So yeah, look, I'm yeah, I, I kind of get. I just I wanted to say to people, Scrolls Part Two. Have you heard this? Who cares about Scrolls? But you know, I don't want to degrade. You know, uh, you know. Uh, put down anything I've done, put down scrolls or anything, but I've absolutely moved on from that in terms of speed and brutality. And, and you know, if you're looking for speed and brutality, just you know, look for you know, my latest stuff. You don't have to, you know, waste your time with scrolls. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Well, I still like scrolls. I, I admittedly, I listened to it this morning uh, while I was driving, and uh, you know, just to kind of get myself back into the mood. Uh, I went from scrolls. I actually listened to it in your preferred order, which would be I listened to scrolls first, and then I moved on to. Uh, well, I, I listened to one Paramecium album because, you know, there's only eight hours in a work day, so I only listened to one album. Uh, <laughs> and which one? Which one? Uh, I listened to Within the Ancient Forest. That's my favorite one. Um, and I do. I prefer like, one. You prefer the first one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do some days, like whenever I'm just feeling really brutal, you know. But uh, well, I mean that song "Injudicial" is still, I mean, one of the one of the heaviest songs that I'll still, you know, when I'm making a playlist of like super brutal songs, I'll still throw that one on there because it just uh, it just kind of hits you right out of the gate. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, pretty happy with that one. But yeah, I moved, so I listened to uh, I listened to "Within the Ancient Forest," and then I went in and listened to "In Exordium." And then I followed it up with uh, with uh, Infernal Atrocity, and yeah, I mean, I definitely agree as far as it being almost a whole new level of speed and and technicality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Look, I guess <clears throat> I've always been into you know progressive kind of music as well, and I recorded um, a progressive uh, EP. Oh, there's there's that word EP again. I said I, I never do. Um, called Sinosis, called Soundscape with um, my really good friend Jason Duran, who was with me in, uh, in Exordium and Paramecium 
and he plays in a band called Altera Enigma as mm-hmm. well. And so, so we did a we did a just a, a three piece. Um, uh, it's like kind of like dream theater without vocals. Uh, it's a sound. It's called Soundscape. Just like a little four song EP kind of thing. We released that um, back in oh man, it might have been two thousand and eight or something like that. So yeah, that was that was fun. <clears throat> so I've always been into into sort of you know jazzier kind of technical sort of music as well. I love death, you know, as a as a as a kid, and you know. It's, Death was a, has been a massive influence on me, um, and yeah, so I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Death is uh, incredible. Even even today, you can you can stack it. Yeah, you can stack it against a lot of current stuff. And even though you know the production quality might not sound as modern, uh, I mean, some of that stuff still is uh, is just incredible. And I, I haven't heard anything else really like it. I've heard a lot of people try to sound like it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. um you know with mixed results i mean there's plenty of there's plenty of technical bands i like too like uh like really into stuff like gore guts and even even some of the later cannibal corpse even though it's not necessarily the most technical out there it's still uh still kind of a cut above the rest but uh what i thought was what i thought was really interesting and this is kind of going back to that old interview you did which is funny because it's fresh in my mind but probably not fresh in your mind <laughs> um <laughs> but uh I, uh, one of the things that you talked about is, you know, whenever you guys reformed Paramecium, you know, the second time you had got, had got the original lineup back, um, and you had switched, uh, mid set list to an exordium. I got the impression that I guess after a while, you know, you'd release the Inexordium album and then more or less revulsed kind of morphed out of an exordium. Like basically everybody left, everybody pretty much left, but you, <laughs> and then you just kind of rebuilt the band and rebranded it. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Maybe I should try and clear this up a little bit too. Um, <laughs> so look without, again, without, throwing anyone under the bus and without saying like and, and yeah yeah i'm not know, digging for um, dirt so whatever you you know <laughs> no 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 no, yeah. no 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 absolutely i mean i you know I, I, look i don't mind talking about this sort of stuff because you know, it's good to let people know you know what happened kind of thing so after after the album you know, was released um you know jason duran kind of called it a day he'd sort of you know, wanted to go on and do other things. And he was, you know, his family, he was very, very busy with his family and and all the rest of it. His young boys were growing up. And so he was pretty busy, you know, and with work and with study and um, all that kind of stuff. So he needed to sort of, you know, step away from an exordium after the album was, re- was released, um, which, which he did an awesome job on. Um, so, so basically it was just kind of the three of us and, and, and and we tried a few uh, guitarists. Um, tried one guitarist, and I I was kind of I was kind of taking you know the lead on you know on I guess the recruiting process of of these guys, and um, I pulled the plug on on on, on one of the um, one of the guitarists to, to the dismay. Of um, certain members of, of an exordium, um, just you know, wondered why the hell would I even do that without even giving it a chance. And and um, I had another friend who I'd played music with in the past, and he was working with a guy called Sheldon DeCosta, a Canadian guy. And uh, he'd moved over here because his wife um, had had scored a job over here, so they moved from Canada to Australia about 10 years ago now um, with their little boy and and they had a daughter um, who was born here soon after that, soon after they moved across. And my friend from the other band just kind of kept bugging me. Oh, this Sheldon guy wants to meet you. He wants to meet you and kind of thing. And I'm like, Oh, okay. What does he, you know, you know, what does he want to meet me? And it's because apparently they got talking and, you know, and they're both metalheads or whatever. And, and, and Sheldon's like, oh, did you play in a band? He said to this, this Steve, this other guy. And he's like, yeah, I play in a band with a guy called Jason Sherlock. And, and Sheldon was like, <gasps> wait a minute. What? I know that name. Yeah. You told me 
what are you talking about, Jason Sherlock? You know, so he he was he was into notification and stuff back in the in the nineties. Sure. So he, he was basically hassling Steve to meet to meet me, and I sort of didn't really sort of pay too much attention to it until finally I met him. He's a really cool guy and really lovely guy. We we clicked really really quickly, and you know, got along really well. And and he's just this monster guitarist and, um, you know, with a great setup and he wasn't even looking for a band. He was just, you know, he, he wasn't sort of, you know, he was just living his life, working and looking after his family and doing a few things here and there. So I, I just kind of asked him, I said, you know, would you be interested in, in trying out for an exordium? You know, we've got a bit of an opening here. So he, he was more than happy to jump on board and, you know, sort of fill in, you know, fill um, Jason's place, you know, and we played a few gigs and, and, you know, we we were kind of, you know, Sheldon and I were really connecting on a musical level, writing new music, um, well, like, you know, with the hope of recording a new an Exordium album. <clears throat> and then um, I just kind of noticed that, you know, we were kind of connecting and, you know, there was a slow kind of disconnect between us and the other other guys, mm-hmm. kind of thing, and 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 we were sort of you know writing, uh, you know, a little bit more heavier, more technical, a bit more, you know, a bit more of a challenge to play, a bit, some sort of more challenging material than we'd done in the past, and it wasn't really it wasn't really, you know, gelling with the other guys kind of thing. And, and I kind of have a bit of a clear vision on, on what I want to do. And I wanted to sort of keep moving forward in that sort of more sort of brutal sort of um, um, direction. And um, so I just had a meeting with the other guys and well, we saw, I called a meeting together and I just said to the other guys, look, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to, you know, move in this direction and you know it's not i don't particularly think it's sort of work, working out so i'm kind of stepping away from from an exordium and you know you guys have the name and and the history and you guys go for it and do what you want to do with it you know i want to sort of go and do something else you know and because sheldon you know was was on board with me musically and and you know he he wanted to you know he had more of a connection with me anyway in terms of you know what we wanted to do and just personally as well he was like well i'm gonna kind of you know i'll I'll go with you kind of thing so he so he stuck with me and and the other guys sort of you know did their thing and that's kind of what really happened you know without you know sort of going into too much sort of gory detail you know what i mean sure um so so, you know and, and unfortunately you know you know nothing happened you know in exordium just sort of sort of flamed out, you know, and, 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 you know, so we, we obviously rebranded as revulsed and, and, you know, continued to, to write, um, infernal atrocity and sort of taking it to the next level. And, and yeah, the rest is kind of history, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I always wanted to, I was always kind of, you know, a little blurry on, on what happened. Cause I remember being like, so excited well first i was super excited when paramecium reformed and i was like oh yeah this is gonna be you know uh they're gonna put out it you know because you know silly fanboy things the fans say like oh man they're gonna they're gonna get together they're gonna do exhumed part two you know what i mean you just for whatever reason we're all like oh yeah this and that part two that's what we all want for some reason even though (laughs) even though if you think about it you know if slayer put out rain and blood part two we'd probably all hate it you know yeah probably (laughs) so if you're I know when you record an album, you know, you feel a certain way and you're a certain age and it's a certain time. <laughs> so going back and redoing it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And look, it would have been good. You know, it, it probably would have been quite fun to, you know, to actually put the Exordium thing aside and actually maybe, you know, maybe do another Paramecium album. That would have been quite fun. But, you know, we, we sort of, I don't know. We, for some reason, we, we you know, we, we sort of sped it up and got made it a little bit heavier and and a little bit, you know, yeah, just sort of picked up the pace a little bit, and that's what you know, uh, in exordium, you know, formed into. So, um, and then obviously, you know, once once that sort of petered out, then we took revolt, you know, and a few more steps up again, you know. So yeah. Well, I've got a few. Uh... I've had a few friends that whenever I told them that I was talking to you tonight, 
Um, they just they had to ask me some horde questions because we were all horde, huge horde heads uh, <laughs> when we were younger. Uh, it's so funny, too, because I remember uh, a buddy of mine whose name is actually Buddy, coincidentally. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> right, that's on, it's on his birth certificate. Short for Budweiser? Yes. But he, uh, I remember I was just kind of joking with him because I had kind of gotten into extreme metal first out of, out of my group of friends. And so I had been listening to the Horde album. I, I got a copy of it. I don't. I think it was at like the Cornerstone Festival or something. Somebody was selling uh, was selling metal CDs, and uh, they had a copy of it. And so I bought it. And I just as a joke, he's like, oh, "I want to hear a new band," you know. And he's listening to stuff that's more you know hard rock, you know. And I was like, "Oh, well, you should listen to this band Horde." And uh, I put it on for him. He, he well, he he listens to it for about oh, I don't know, maybe like he gets about three tracks in, and he goes, "I love this. Like, where can I find more stuff that sounds like this?" <laughs> and from then on, he was uh, he was all about the black metal. Uh, Jay, or, oh no, I know, right? Oh no. <laughs> so what what got him into black metal? Yeah. Well, it was, uh, well, I, I don't, I don't know what the term is it for it anymore. You know, we used to, we used to call it on black metal back in the day and then we started calling it Christian black metal, but then everybody says, well, that sounds like it's a contradiction and blah, blah, blah. So we, I basically now it's just like, there's, there's some black metal bands that have Christian lyrics and then some black metal bands that don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, yeah, look, look, I think I've, I've always been, I've always taken the stance of, of the, you know, of, of of the black metal dudes in terms in terms of the you know the labeling and all that kind of stuff. I don't believe that there's any, any such thing as Christian. But you can't have Christian black metal because black metal is is supposed to be dark, grim, evil sounding, evil music. You know, and it's like it's like having you know. I, I remember seeing a few interviews with some black metal dudes. It's like you know, there's one guy. Said it's like you know Santa Claus, Pol Pot, you know, having a you know a, a, a murderous dictator, you know, combined with you know a guy who gives presents. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? So so so, I, so that's why I called it unblack metal, you know, holy uh, holy unblack metal, which was basically the inversion of you know unholy black metal taken from you know the dark for an hour, either like blaze in the northern sky or or under a funeral moon. I think it might be. A, Funeral and they say dark fern play on holy black metal. So I just kind of reversed that and coined a coined a term, and and sort of and that's sort of where that came from. Un black metal because it's not black metal. It's 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 you know you know the lyrics are against evil. They're against you know, satanic sort of values. So you can't really call it. I can't call it black metal because that black metal is not black metal. You can't sing about you know killing Satan if, if it's black metal. Yeah, that's that's my take on it. No, I, I totally get what you're saying. I think for us, it was just more of a labeling thing. We didn't know what to call it, you know, and it was one of those things where you'd say unblack metal. And then, and I don't know if it's this way in the U.S. or, or, uh, or I don't know if it's this way in the, in Australia as it is in the U.S., but you walk around saying, you know, unblack too much and people start ask, start thinking that you're talking about something totally different. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you run into that. So I think that that was whenever we had started adopting the term Christian black metal as much of a contradictions as it may have sounded but you know there's a lot of people out there that say you can't have christian metal you know so yeah well, i mean look i guess that's the difference between you know like just like like death metal you know you can sing about corpses you can sing about chopping up people you can sing about environmental issues you can talk you can sing about you know virtually any any subject matter and it's base. It's really just it's it's just the sound that that defines the genre you know, if it's if it's if it's got, you know, brutal low tune guitars, if it's got double kick, if it's got, you know, guttural vocals, then chances are it's gonna be death metal, you know. But with black metal but with black metal there's another step there's another element that you need and, and that is it's gotta be thematically it's gotta be thematically evil and thematically dark. You know, to to be black metal. So it's just it's just another it's just another another element that you need. You know, to complete you know that sort of you know genre definition, if that makes sense. Sure. No, that definitely. In my mind, and and I think I think most 
um, it's definitely one of those, uh, it's definitely one of those things where it's a rare occurrence where the lyrical content actually plays into the, uh, act- yeah. into the, into the definition of the genre. I think black metal is unique in that, in that regard. Um, yeah, definitely. yeah, I mean, I mean, Viking metal would be pretty similar because, you know, obviously Viking metal, they sing about Vikings and you know, Valhalla and, you know, drinking ale and, you know, raping, you know, and pillaging, you know what I mean? It's sure. the same kind of thing. You can't really have Viking metal and sing about, you know, um, pussycats, you know, it wouldn't make <laughs> any sense. And I, I guess that's another, 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 you know, um, example of that as well. <clears throat> Well, one of the things about Horde that always kind of, um, I always wondered, there were so many rumors, like in the earlier days, when I first started getting on the internet and reading about these bands and trying to find information, almost all the information you find about a band was wrong, you know, uh, or, or skewed in some way, you know, like, like the idea that you were getting, you know, tons of death threats and stuff. And then it turns out that, you know, well, not, not really, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no, not, not even one, not even but uh there was one that i always uh always kind of wrote down that if i ever had a chance um to ask was so the band the band before it was called horde was actually called beheadeth is that correct well when you say band that's a loose term it was just me the project <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay yeah 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 basically i think um i think steve Rowe asked me to do a song for a compilation album or something that he was doing back in the day. And, and I thought, Oh, I could probably do something, you know? So I, I quickly wrote this song. Um, and then he released it on his, on his, um, on his compilation album. That was bad off. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, there was another one. V- Volmoth? Yeah. Volmoth. Was it? Uh, no, Volmoth was a different guy. Okay. Different guy. I, I was still good friend. I'm still good friends with him, um, and I was involved in that s- somewhat, but only quite loosely. I think I might have designed the logo for him and and maybe just helped him out a little bit. But you know, we were mates back then, and we hung out a fair bit. And but that wasn't me actually. Well, that's cool. It says uh, it says on your. Uh, I, I read on the metal archives all the time. That's how I check out new bands. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that site. Yeah. But... It's a- I love that. Yeah, that's one one of my favorites. Yeah. On your, you actually have your own page on there, uh, and it says uh, it is believed that he was behind the band Vomith, but this has never been confirmed. Well, guess what? Now it's been confirmed that he was not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a little bit to do. In, involved, but not not the man yeah. behind the project. Yeah. So. Not. No. Okay. Well, that was always just one yeah. of those dumb things that I always wondered. Because, like, you know, back then it was always like, you know, for a while, I mean, nobody even, at least as far as, you know, over here in the States, even knew that you were behind the Horde project. You know, it was always just, oh, it's just this mysterious <laughs> album that was released. Well, it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be mysterious. And, I, I, you know, I didn't really want, you know, I, I didn't really care, but it was just, you know, just the mistake of, you know, having this dude anonymous you know which happened to rhyme with anonymous which was perfect and and meant that you know meant that you know his identity was a secret so it kind of worked out well yeah absolutely well and one of the funny things that you'd said on that interview that i i just so is you absolutely just went into the studio and recorded all of the drums for that album before recording anything else like there wasn't like any any tracks or like scratch tracks or anything to go off of absolutely nothing man and no i don't even think we had a click track so there was no click track no scratch tracks i think i just went in there put the headphones on had the song in my head and just recorded it that's uh not to be a fanboy but that is uh that is a whole different level of musicianship. <laughs> you know, I, I, you don't hear that too often. Um, the only the only other thing I've ever heard that was that crazy was I think it was like somebody had called. I, I heard an interview. Well, actually, it might have been with the same guy that interviewed you, uh, Travis. He uh, he he was interviewing Gene Hoagland, and apparently somebody had called Gene Hoagland to see if he could fill in on some tour dates with a band. I think the I think the band was Unearth or something like that. And uh, he's like, you know, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then he stopped at a Best Buy on his way to meet them at the tour and, like, listened to their albums on the way <laughs> to meeting them <laughs> and then was able to just get up and play. You know, <laughs> I was like, 
that's in, that's insane. I mean, the only thing I've ever done musically is is vocals, and uh, you know, you know, vocalists. We don't know what we're doing, you know, most of the time. And so, you know, like I can't. A lot of the times, I remember writing lyrics on my arms and hands and trying to make it look like tattoos so that people couldn't tell, you know, that I couldn't remember my song. So to hear to hear that a drummer can go into a studio and record a a project that's that extreme with no click track, no scratch tracks. Nothing to really guide other than just the knowledge of the songs, which I mean, maybe is easier if you, because you wrote the songs. Yeah, definitely. Look, definitely. I mean, I, if, if I wasn't so so connected to the songs, and if I didn't have the songs in my head, so you know, so um, if the songs weren't cemented in, into my brain like they were, I don't think I had a chance. But even even you know, having said that. You know, I could probably even say now that you know there are there are definitely um, passages you know within some of the songs on on the album that are you know maybe a little bit too short or a little bit too long. You know, and, and you can kind of tell when the vocals kind of you know might finish a little bit earlier than you think, and there's a little bit, and that's just purely because you know I played that particular section just a little bit too many times and we didn't edit it you know that's that and that's the other thing too nothing was edited everything was just bang there it is kind of thing. well yeah and i think that fits with the style 100 percent. you know you know yeah. you know, a lot of the yeah. guys that played similar music you know probably didn't give a shit at all about you know editing or yeah. you know making it sound like oh you know perfect but uh yeah, yeah I, I thought it, I, I thought that was really interesting and the the other thing too was that with it being such a mysterious project and being something that was kind of, you know, I think it was it was several years later whenever you had kind of officially come out and said, yeah, yeah, it was me, um, you know, publicly. And then, you know, just a few years later, you're over at Nordic Fest playing with songs. Was that something that you were, <laughs> was that something that, that, that you were doing because people had just asked you to do it for such a long time? Or was it just like, oh, I think it'd be fun to get up and actually play these songs? Well, I, I, it was actually a little bit of both. When, when we um, got invited to play Nordic Fest with Paramecium in 06, um, I kind of got a, a secret little um, side email uh, from the guys from Nordic Fest saying, oh, you know, we've got a crazy idea. You know, there's a band over here called Drottnar and they're really big big fans of Horde. And, you know, we'd be honoured if you could, you know, maybe just get up and play, you know, maybe a couple of songs or do some vocals on a couple of songs you know, during one of their sets or something like that. And I'm like, oh, I kind of thought about it. And, and you know, me, I, 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 I kind of don't like to do things by halves. So I kind of said, well, if you can get the other guys to, to learn, you know, you know, the rest of the songs, then I'd be, I'd be happy to actually play, you know, a full show. So I'd do vocals and, and drums as long as the other guys could, you know, do the two guitars and, and the bass. So and they obviously were like really 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 excited to to hear that. So they they jumped on board for that straight away. So so Horde headlined uh, the the Friday night and Paramecium did the Saturday night. So um, yeah, so that's kind of how that kind of happened. And, and as as it turns out, you know the the, the Drottnar dudes actually knew all the songs anyway. So yeah, I was gonna say those guys. Things. There's a good chance those they mm-hmm. already knew all those songs. Yeah. Yeah, and and they did, and and they pulled it off amazingly, and. I've made you know lifetime friends out of those guys because of that experience. Yeah, they're they're an incredible band. I uh, I, I've been following them for a really long time, good, and really good dude. Yeah, some of the stuff that they're putting out now, it's almost like technical, like te- like if you could call it like almost technical black metal. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's different. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I reckon they've always been like that ever since Welterwork, which was recorded, which was back back in those days. Yeah. But uh, yeah, now we have uh, now we actually have a horde DVD that we can watch, um, which is something that yeah, and that was that, that was that was the same show. So that was um, yeah, we we recorded that DVD on that on that night. Um, yeah, and, and look, I, I just get kept getting, you know, once once people got wind of that um, show, you know, I kind of kept getting asked back to Europe, playing a few different countries over the next kind of ten years, really, kind of thing. So, with the same guys, so right now we're always ready to 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 come and play. But it would it would it really only kind of worked for Europe because it was a bit closer, you know, for them to go. So they only really had to fly me out there, you know. Yeah, but that was that was really cool experience i think and i think in the united states it would be a hard sell um just yeah. uh just for the just for the fact that uh well i don't know you probably would have done pretty well at like a cornerstone festival or like one of the one of the bigger festivals and that's something that that, that i kind of wanted to bring up too with a history of being yeah. 
being in you know for for lack of a better term you know christian oriented bands um you know even though like with revulsed as far as i can tell there there's a little bit of that in there but it's it, primarily a death metal you know like a, almost a pure death metal uh project which uh which i appreciate but has there ever been like a like i was talking about oh you do good at a christian festival here christian festival there H- has that kind of been um has that kind of been par for the course you know even since when you were drumming back in mortification um was there a lot of of secular involvement as far as shows or uh festivals festivals or, or things like that 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 you guys were invited to play and it's not necessarily just with mortification or you know with that way with paramecium as well or definitely um not so much not so much festivals really festivals festivals i've only really sort of taken really sort of taken off i don't know well i guess there was there was um black stump festival in sydney in new south wales um back in the day but, you know, back with Mortification back in the day, that was kind of the only festival that we ever played. You know, everything else was really like pub shows, you know, like we'd just do a, we'd do a, like a, a pub sort of tour, you know, kind of thing, like like the Scrolls tour or the, or the, or the, um, or the Post Momentary tour or whatever, you know, we'd just jump in Steve's van and basically drive all around the country and just play play pubs, you know, and, and, and none of those are, are Christian shows, you know, so, you know, I, I, I reckon back in the day, we probably played more, more, you know, pub shows than we did Christian shows for sure. Do you think that had to do with the fact that they really, there wasn't really a Christian metal, especially in the nineties. I mean, there was a Christian metal scene, obviously here in the U S yeah. but there really wasn't like almost kind of like how it is now, where if you could, you know, you and you and 10 of your friends could start a, or 10 of your friends, you and like three or four of your friends could start a, a, yeah. a Christian metal band and live out your entire career within that you know, within that bubble, only playing at churches and only playing at, you know, Christian venues. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I kind of, <clears throat> I don't know. I just, I just, I, I, I'd rather not see and just, just the idea of that, you know, defining that as a bubble is really, you know, it kind of irks me, you know, I'd rather break out of that and, and just play metal for people, you know, who love, who love metal, you know, and, and, um, you know, I'm, I mean, you know, as, as a point of difference, as a point of difference, you know, revolved, you know, definitely have, um, definitely have lyrics that have, you know, a, you know, some kind of a faith sort of level in there, but, you know, there's no, you know, there's no Jesus, this or Jesus, they were shoving anything down people's throat, you know, people, you know, have the, have the right to, to pick and choose what they want to believe. And, and, and I absolutely respect that. And, you know, I'm not here to force anyone to have the same beliefs as I, as, as me, um, you know, um, but, but having said that, you know, I, I want to, you know, stand out a little bit from, you know, from the norm, you know, everyone else is sort of singing about kind of similar kind of stuff. So it's nice to, you know, throw something, you know, have a little bit more of a positive sort of spin on it. Not that anything, nothing else is, you know, what the other bands are, are doing isn't positive. I mean, you know, bands like Defeated Sanity are, are singing about awesome stuff. Like, you know, even, you know, one of their songs, I can't remember the name, and I think it was off Passages into Deformity. It's like, you know, Exposing Satanism, which is like, you know, a pretty, a pretty bold sort of thing, you know, for, you know, for a band to do, um, you know, and a few of their, a few of their songs now are sort of about Buddhism and, and, you know, you know, like, um, there's a song called Disposal of the Dead, which is, you know, or Generosity of the Deceased, you know, which is about, you know, um, you know, the earth being regenerated by, by a corpse kind of thing. So it's like, you know, you know, when someone dies, you know, their, their, their body sort of gives back to the earth kind of thing. So that's, that's a, that's a positive, you know, message as well. So, um, yeah, well, I, I prefer to, you know, sort of, yeah, I, I like to put some positive, positive spin on the lyrics and, but keep it really brutal as well. Like, you know, you know, put it in, 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 you know, in a brutal kind of context and you sort of, you read the lyrics and go, man, these lyrics are pretty brutal and you sort of dig a bit deeper and you go, oh, okay, oh, that's what that's about. Yeah, right, cool. So it's, it's not like, you know, yeah, like, yeah, you, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of, a lot of friends in, in the underground scene and, and, you know, we're, you know, there's value in everything, you know, I just, you know, I love being a part of, it's a family, man, you know, like, you know, from Defeated Sanity to, you know, Devangelic 
to you know wh- whoever else. You know, there's so many, so many. It's, we're, we're just a family, you know, and it's awesome to be to be a part of that network of of, of brutal bands, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I found metal to be one of the most accepting communities. You know, even yeah. uh, and he, you know, and I was actually surprised by that because you know, like I said before, I got most of my introduction. And if you've if you've ever listened to my other podcast, uh, discography discussion. I'm very open on that yeah. about, you know, uh, how I started all of my, you know, I wouldn't be into metal if it wasn't for those Christian metal bands, like stuff like Vengeance and Mortification and Deliver and Target yeah, yeah. and those kind yeah. of bands. And then I started listening yeah, yeah. to other bands cause I just liked the sound so much, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's so much more accepting in the metal scene that I was even accepted into that as a Christian, you know, whenever we started talking about that in, uh, when we started talking about that on the other podcast, I was ready for the hate mail to come in, you know, uh, (laughs) almost immediately. And what it really turned into was, uh, I probably got more hate mail from not, from people that were Christians than I did from people that weren't, um, you know, everybody else is just like, yeah, man, it's really sad. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, and, and I've found that too. You know, a lot of people. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, that, that Christians tend to be a bit like that. You know, it's it's really really sad. You know, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's I. It's just a little side tangent. But yeah, no, I, I think it's cool, especially with Revolst. You know, one of the things that you know, as as I got older, I got less and less into the the evangelical sort of band. So to so to have stuff like Revolst, you know, now in 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 twenty nineteen. You know, um, to to have to have something like that where it's like, yeah, you know, these these are these are guys that that I share a belief system with, but it's not like you know you don't pop it open. And there's a salvation prayer that falls out of the the liner notes when you open it up, or you know, <laughs> there's not a no. Nah, it's about it's about it's about friendships. You know, it's about it's about a community. It's about you know respecting other people's beliefs and and respecting what they want to do and and, and loving them anyway. You know, it's got nothing to do with. You know, you know, just that whole thing of, you know, oh, you know, yeah, got to get another one saved. Yeah, got to get just, you know, sort of keeping tally. It's not about that, man. It's just about, it's about, you know, showing love to people no matter who they are. You know, just being, just being friends and being genuine and being honest and just being part of a big metal family. You know, and yeah, that's, and and I've found, you know, from my experience, especially, you know, with Revolts, you know, there's just there's so much love and. And um, yeah, I just I'm just I'm privileged to be a part of. I mean, and this is you know this is the other thing that blows my mind too is that you know how many people can say that you know you know they've, they've got friends, really good friends in some of the in some of your favorite bands. You know what I mean? That's that that blows my mind. That's the beautiful thing about the underground is that you know you can have. You can have a bunch of your favorite bands, and yet they're your buddies too. That, that, that's that that blows my mind. You know, that still, you know, freaks me out even even today. You know, like, you know, when I first started chatting with Connie from Defeated Sanity, you know, Defeated Sanity are pretty much you know one of my favorite brutal death metal bands. You know, and you know I'm talking away to him, and man, you know, you're my favorite vocalist, and yada yada, and, and Connie's like, what? I used to, I used to listen to you know you on Headbangers Ball back in you know the early nineties. What he does when I was a kid, I'd, you know, and I'm freaking out, and he's freaking out, and it's like this, you know, this mutual sort of thing, you know, and 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 before that conversation, I, I just, you know, I, I don't, I don't go around thinking about stuff like that. I don't think, you know, oh, I was in North I was doing this, and everyone knows me. I don't think like that. I'm just like a dude who, who's a fan. I'm a fanboy, man. I just, I love, I love bands, and I love metal, and I love playing, and that's 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 the end of the story. You know, it's just. It's a privilege to be able to play this awesome music and and to have you know so many cool cool friends around the world. You know, it's awesome. And do you think that's what drives you to keep doing it? You know, a lot of guys, uh, a lot of guys after after their first band or their second band, you know, they just kind of hang it up and they're like, well, I guess I didn't make it. You know, I mean, that that's definitely what I did. You know, probably ten, twelve years ago. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think. You know, you still, you know, there are some people, you know, like that, but there are some people that are probably a bit more driven. And I mean, it's in the blood for me, you know, like I, I know people who, you know, say they used to be into metal and I'm like, oh, well, were you ever really into metal? You know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's like, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime thing for me. I just, 
you know, I'd, I'll, I'll hang up the phone today and I'll think about riffs, you know, because sure. it's just, I'll, I'll take a breath and I'll think about a riff, you know, it's, it's just what I do. You know, I'll, I'll take a dump and I'll think about a riff while I'm on the, you know, on the crapper. It's just how it works, you know, it's just how I'm wired. So, and I know people like that and, and, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just what I do and it's not, um, you know, that I'm trying to succeed or I'm trying to, you know, get this many Facebook likes or this many, whatever, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I'm, I, I always remember, um, you know, you know, we had a, a, a little adage that we used to say to ourselves, you know, you know, play to three at three, you know, even if you play to three people at three o'clock in the morning, it doesn't make any difference. You, you do it because you love, because you love what you do, you know? Very cool. Well, and I think uh, I think that's a strong enough uh, I think that's a strong enough sentence to or a strong enough thought to uh, to end it with. Um, Not cool. Okay. You know, that went quick. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We tend to keep it quick um, on these, yeah. just because I know uh, <laughs> on my other podcasts, some of our episodes go like two, three hours or something like that. And the... oh, okay. Well, I haven't heard any screaming children yet, so all is good. Yeah, no, you're perfect. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just read the outro. It doesn't mean we have to stop talking, but uh, there's a uh, uh, yeah. Let me uh, let me just finish my outro here. And okay, so well, I'm gonna just pretend like I, you know, like I'm actually hanging up. So, <laughs> just just for the record. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to me tonight. Um, definitely a bucket list interview for me. Um, been a fan for years, and it's a lot of fun to catch up with you and find out, you know, what you've got going on now. Awesome, man. It was, it was an absolute pleasure. And, uh, yeah, take care. And, and uh, as uh, my inspiration uh, always said, Mr. Chuck Sheldon, let the metal flow. So, yeah, I think that went really well. Is that really your start to the, the the last part of it? Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay, I'll keep. That. No, no, I'll, it's fine. Okay, no, I was gonna say I'll no, keep all no, this in. <laughs> if you hate it, if you hate no, it, I'm not gonna. I'll go keep with it, it in. I think it's funny. I'm high as shit right now. I'll be. <laughs> it's all good to me. Yeah, iron sharpens iron, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just usually there's like a and that was my conversation with and blah 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 and then you're just like oh, I thought that went well <laughs> I could hear your arm breaking patting yourself on the back <laughs> I was like fuck yeah bitch yeah no right. I, I did think that was pretty good I, I thought uh you know the thing that was kind of interesting to me is you were picking a fight with him kind of about like what kind of style of music he played and I'm like damn he, I think he, of all people, knows what he's playing. I went into full discography discussion mode on that one. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where there is actually a debate. Like, okay, this is like this is like some really underground shit I'm about to get into, okay? Uh, so for years, there there has been a debate. So in case you don't know or you had no idea what the hell we were talking about in that interview, Jason was one of the very first very first musicians in in I, I don't want to say in the Christian market but in a band that has lyrics about Christianity was one of the first if not the first person to play like dark throne mayhem style music like a lot of that a lot of that Scandinavian black metal from the early 90s he was one of the very first Christians to step up and play that style of music and he played the entire album by himself so like I don't want anybody to miss out on that like it is one of the fastest drum performances I've ever heard from a human being and it is so fast and so furious and I even asked him in the interview I was like did you really record the drums off the top of your head like you you already knew all the drum parts and recorded them first like that blew my mind well when you talked about that i immediately thought of uh when mashuga back when they were doing ozfest in 2001 i think the band never so the legend goes the band never actually rehearsed in a room together they just learned all their shit individually and i think they might have done like a well internet back then was garbage so i doubt they did a skype uh session like they can do now but basically they just all learned the set on their own and then went and played better than like everybody else in the world and you're just like it, like you hear shit like that and you're just like some people are too good uh for their own good and it makes you just want to quit doing whatever it is if you are even like remotely interested in playing music or if you're like if you're a drummer and you hear a story like that you're like well fuck i should just quit because i mean i'm never gonna be that good 
Yeah, like it's it's insane. And so that that being kind of a side ch- tangent, but back to your original point with, with me kind of talking back and forth about the style of music that he plays. So for years after that Horde album came out, so the 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 album's called uh, it basically translates uh, "Holy Unblack." So you know bands would say like <laughs> so band, bands would say like oh I'm black metal I play black metal, and so Jason was just like well I'm not black metal because I don't worship Satan, you know, <laughs> or I'm not like a pagan, you know, like I don't have the pagan beliefs and all that, you know, he I can't say every black metal band worships Satan, but you understand what I'm saying. Like that satanic imagery. And he's like, well, what I'm trying to do is the opposite of that. So whenever it's called unblack metal, he kind of coined that term of unblack metal. And they're actually for years on like message boards and, and stuff like that. Cause we used to just do message boards before we listen to podcasts. And, uh, we basically would go back and forth about, well, is it okay to call it Christian death metal? And, or should we just call it unblack? And, you know, unblack's a good term for people that are, that are comfortable with it. Uh, I wasn't always as comfortable with it. So I would, I would call it like black metal with Christian lyrics, but, uh, Jason kind of, he, I mean, he kind of shut me down. He's like, no, he's like, you can't have Christian black metal. Like it's not, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. And then I made the comment that, yeah, it's one of the rare musical genres where the lyrical content actually is part of the definition of it. Whereas with other styles of music, it's more just about the music. Well, I mean, that's kind of something too, that I've kind of touched on quite a bit is like, you know, I think you were actually just talking about this on the impending doom episode on discography discussion about, you know, these genres that started more in extreme metal, but like, you know, like with black metal, like the lyrical content of most of what that's about and so forth, or, you know, grind and stuff like that. And then to have a, a Christian counterpart to it always kind of seems very counter. I don't know if counterintuitive uh, is the word I want to use, but that basically it's a thing where it just doesn't seem like it should exist because the thing that makes that what it is, is also it's the extremity extremity of the, musical composition but it's also the lyrical themes that are running through and so to kind of put a christian tinge on that always seems kind of disingenuous yeah and i think in some cases that's absolutely the truth i i do think it's a little different in this case like let me let me pitch it to you this way you know if you if you believe hardcore in something you know let's say you're let's say you're um i don't know uh i'm trying to think of like a an a an an issue or something that you have issue. Like if you listen to music that frequently disrespects women. <laughs> okay. So you're a Chris Brown fan. Like, like metal uh, actually, or, or, you know, glass jaw, you know, early glass jaw. Uh, and, and, and you're a woman and you're listening to these songs about beating women or, you know, killing women in certain cases or, or, or just treating women like objects or whatever. But you really like the beat. You like the music. You like the guitar work. You like all of that stuff. Shouldn't you be allowed, or shouldn't it, shouldn't there be some sort of facilitation for you to listen to stuff that's not that, like doesn't have that lyrical content, but still has, you know, it's it's the same equivalent of changing the channel where you're like, you know, I, I want to watch the, because you, know, you see a lot on Facebook and on Twitter and all socials really now where people, people have been saying like, hey, if you don't agree with what I'm about to say, just defriend me or block me. And so I, I don't necessarily see it as disingenuous because I think it's more of just a, hey, if you like this style or whatever, you can have it with a different perspective. And I think some bands do it really well. And I think some bands, it's obviously like a cash grab or or it's a we're just writing these lyrics just to make people happy. And I think that that's the, the hardest part about Christians or, or even any any religion, like religious people making art, is that people wonder how much of it is the art and how much of it is the religion. You know, and I think religion makes it really hard because people feel like they're being sold on something. But I think uh, I think with the Horde album, to, to put it in perspective, was more of just a, hey, these guys are doing a whole bunch of shit that's really negative, and I wanted to do something that was more positive. You know, or at least at least positive for, you know, maybe somebody that's a hardcore Satan is going to say that's not positive because it has all this religion in it that's his perspective but if you're somebody that's not if you're somebody that's uh, you know a christian but you like hearing that fast tremolo picking and blast beats and stuff like you should be allowed to have that without you know having to hear all the stuff that's like against you so i mean i i think it goes both ways and it really depends on the band i think i think like early mortification that like that Jason was on did that with death metal really well uh, because they still had the, they had the strong death metal energy like uh, imagery and they were just as heavy and brutal as any other band out there uh, if not more so really um, 
I don't really think any of the projects Jason himself has, has been in has had that, like, I'm trying to sell you something tinge. I think whenever he was, because he was always doing it cutting edge, you know, Mortification was one of the first death metal bands that had, like, Christian lyrics. Horde was clearly the first band that played a black metal style. See how PC I'm getting with, with saying that? I want to say Christian death metal, but, or Christian black metal, but uh, they were one of the first to, to do that, and... So he's always been kind of on the bleeding edge of that. So I think his efforts have been more genuine, I think, than maybe like a band that gets brought up by a church to sign to a Christian label. Because we talked about that too, like the bands that only exist in the Christian market and bands like Mortification and Horde, like they were put out in the in the general market. Like Chris, like, you know, it's funny you were on uh, you were recently on Toomey's radio show and you guys were joking about. Um, about like oh going to the christian bookstore to buy stuff or whatever and like <laughs> you definitely you definitely could do that uh but you could also find like these albums in just regular metal shops in the metal section not in their own section and so they kind of come across more in that regard as just kind of this unique different thing that somebody was doing but just like anything you know unfortunately an entire business model erupted based around on it uh, based around it and now you have like an industry that's only that whereas back when they were doing it they're like well we're going to try this thing and, and see how it goes and so i think I, I think in that regard i it's it's cool and that's that's why i like talking to him because he's been doing it for so long and he's still in like there aren't very many guys that have been doing it as long as he's been doing it that are still doing it at the level that he is like he's a better drummer now than he ever has been and that's that's crazy as most musicians later on in life yeah like you know you're like okay you know well now i'm now i'm playing in a pop rock band actually funny thing when i was looking for his uh, handle on twitter i did see someone reply back to tim lambesis and i i didn't look at what tim posted but i think it was something to the effect of like who's a better one man band and someone goes oh most people probably say dave grohl but i'm going to say jason sherlock i thought that was funny oh yeah that's awesome yeah like and it's completely true um but i think i think the band he's got together now with revulsed i mean it is I can't wait to hear their second album. Like, unfortunately, their first album, it came out, but it came out in a relatively limited capacity, so it didn't really get out. And it's only recently that, you know, you can stream the album now. You can buy it on Bandcamp, and you can you can get the vinyl. You can get all that good stuff. So in a lot of ways, like, when they signed to their new label, it really was like a new beginning for the band. Uh, and I think this was a really exciting time to jump on, and, and you know, they're going to put out a second album. And I, I think... Uh, I think Revulsed is a is is a really cool band that needs to uh, needs to explode. Yeah, well, maybe we'll, it'll be one of those bands uh, where when you look back in a year or so from now, I'd be like, "Holy shit, we got them before they became like this big band." Right? Yeah, I, I I would love that. I know he's like he's like, yeah. I mean, we're all married and you know live our lives and do stuff at our own pace. But uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think I think if it does well, you know, they'll have no choice but come over here in the states and uh, you know grind us into the ground. There you go. And if you guys want to hear Revulsed online, you can check them out at their Bandcamp at revulsed.bandcamp.com. You can stream their whole album there. You can order it. You can check it out. You can leave comments. And another place you can leave them comments is on their Facebook page at facebook.com slash revulseddm. And, yeah, they don't really have any other socials, so that's the best we can do for you. Uh, if you would like to keep up with Metal Nexus, you can find them at MetalNexus.net, Facebook at Metal Nexus, Instagram at Metal.Nexus, and Twitter at Metal underscore Nexus. And Dan's going to tell us where he can be found. Oh, man, I can be found at home. I can be found at work. And if you really want to find me, you can find me on Facebook under Daniel Terry. You can find my other podcast, Discography Discussion, at DiscussMetal.com. And you can even tweet at me at DiscussMetalDan. And if you would like to keep up with all things this podcast, you can find us simply enough at Bruce Speak Pod on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Find us on YouTube, too. We uh, have some videos of some of the interviews that we've been doing lately and uh, some that are upcoming. And if you would like to uh, email us and become a show sponsor, you can definitely do that as well. Speaking of show sponsors, if you would like to keep up with The Bean Bastard, this episode's show sponsor, you can go to TheBeanBastard.com and get you some delicious coffee. Keep up with all their going-ons uh, with the be- rebuild of their Bean Mobile uh, over at The Bean Bastard on Facebook and Instagram. And for the Brutally Speaking podcast, I am John. And I am Dan. And we will talk to you all next time.